Hello and welcome to another round of episode of SecDef Talks, which is a series of dialogues on technology, security and privacy brought to you by The Dialogue in partnership with Nullcon and CNN News 18. My name is Kazim Rizvi. I am the founder of The Dialogue and thank you so much for uh, watching us today. And we are very proud and really excited to bring a very special guest today. His name is uh, Dr. Tahir. He is the Chief Technology Officer of Salesforce Global. Dr. Tahir, how are you doing today? I am well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing good as well. And thank you so much for joining us from an early morning in San Francisco. Thank you for joining me. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tahir. And just to give you all a brief background of Dr. Tahir, he is an Egyptian cryptographer and entrepreneur, and he is recognized as the father of SSL, which is Secure Sockets Layer, a standard security technology for establishing an encrypted link between a server and a client. For example, a web server and a browser or an email server and a mail client. Dr. Tahir is a renowned uh, global figure in the uh, field of technology and privacy, as well as encryption, and we are really grateful to have him today on the show. I'm also joined with my colleagues from the Dialogue, uh, Mr. Saika Datta, who is an advisor to the Dialogue and Nalcon, and I'm also joined with Mr. Antrik Shah, who is a co-founder with Nalcon. And as we move forward, Dr. Tahir, once again, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We have a series of questions which we will be asking you between the three of us and my colleagues will then take over from me after every round. Uh, and as we begin, Dr. Tahir, uh, the first question, in fact, which I really want to ask you and understand from you, uh, as the father of SSL, what was the motivation or the need to create uh, TLS uh, when SSL was already there? Over to you, sir. So um, let me try to clarify what these are. Um, so in the mid nineties, uh, a company called Netscape was uh, started uh, by Jim Clark and Mark Andreessen. And the goal of that company was to enable e-commerce over the internet. The internet existed a long time ago. And you know, we sat down in a room and very quickly, we came to the conclusion that allowing confidential information like payment information to, to travel over an open network would be a, a big confidentiality problem. So SSL was actually developed at Netscape in 95 and 96. The first public RFC uh, was, was out for SSL 3.0, uh, maybe in March of 96. Uh, and at the time, the web, the internet was very young. So, so we wanted to get the world basically to adopt this new security technology. SSL, as you mentioned, was based on cryptography. So, so it's, it's like the very first security technology we ever use on the internet was actually based on cryptography, which is fun because of course that's what my background is. Uh, but it was obvious that a proprietary protocol was not going to become the, the standard in the world. It's very hard and Netscape was a small company at the time. So we made a decision to take the technology, which we had patents for, to the IETF, to standardize. And we agreed with Microsoft at the time that everybody will adopt the same protocol so that it doesn't matter which browser and which server anybody uses, you use the exact same protocol. When SSL 3.0 was, was uh, put in the IETF, the IETF called it TLS. So TLS is just a new name. Um, and if you look at the specification of SSL 3.0 and TLS 1.0, they're very, very similar. The, the changes were very minor. But TLS technically is, is a more appropriate name because it's transport layer, which is really where SSL is. Uh, it's not really a socket interface, which is where the secure socket layer came from. So it, it was renamed SS, uh, TLS 1.0 at the IETF. And over the years, people found weaknesses in the protocol and the protocol got adopted. So now we're, we're at TLS 1.3 and it's still being issued by the IETF and basically everybody, uh, everybody supports it, which, which was a great success. Thank you, Dr. Tahir. And uh, I think we'll also 
uh, get back to you on some more technical questions, but uh, a follow-up question and something which we've been also working on, uh, which I would like to understand from you, is um, when we're looking at global ecosystems, we are seeing that governments are increasingly seeking to ensure less encryption uh, for citizens and uh, in the name of national security and law enforcement. Uh, globally. Um, how do you, uh, as somebody who's designed such technology protocols, view these uh, global trends? And what do you think does it mean for uh, individual privacy? Uh, I, I think we're not talking to each other. I, 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 think, I think individuals are entitled to privacy rights. And I think law enforcement, for example, or national security are entitled to, to defend countries. So, so these two these two issues are not exactly in agreement, but if each side makes their own mind and moves forward without consulting the other side, it's just we don't get anywhere. So I think the real solution is for the industry and the governments, and it's not just the Indian government. A lot of governments have the same view. And in fact, they do have a correct view because part of their duty is to protect the citizen. So, so how that, does that get done technically is, is, is not really a subject we're going to discuss today necessarily. But the conversation needs to happen because I believe most businesses are not there to hurt the government. And the government doesn't want to hurt their own businesses. It's, it's a matter of collaboration, which we kind of lacked over, over the last several years. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to move to our colleague, Mr. Antriksha. Antriksha, over to you. Uh, doctor, I would like to ask you, when you built SSL, uh, what were you hoping to achieve from the industry? Besides building a very successful product or a commercial product, what were you hoping for the industry to contribute uh, to take it to the next level? Because there are various versions of SSL as well. It was built to enable e-commerce. It was very, very specific. The objective was not to allow encryption. The objective was to enable e-commerce. And because e-commerce requires that the consumer send some payment information to some server to, to process the transaction, that information is very confidential. And we felt like that, that unless we actually have a protocol that identifies the server correctly to the consumer and provides the integrity and the confidentiality properly, that e-commerce would not be successful. And it turns out we're right because the success of e-commerce was really partially because SSL solved a big problem in that space. I have a follow-up question. Let's talk about decryption. Does it worry you that drug dealers, terrorists, you know, uh, child pornographers are using encryption to ensure LEAs are hobbled in their efforts to curb such attacks or crimes? Of course. Nobody likes criminals. Uh, but that does not mean that, that honest citizens don't deserve privacy. It's, it's, it's a two-sided problem. And, you know, solving, solving one without the other is, is not the right thing. So, of course, it worries me that there are criminals that use the internet with its encryption for bad things. But, but that does not mean, you know, honest people, 99% of the world is honest people, don't deserve their own, their own privacy. It's, it's, but the problem is, is dual. And again, you know, until the two sides sit down and try to solve the problem, it's kind of hard to solve. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to invite Saikat to ask his questions. Thank you so much, Antriksh, cousin. Dr. Tair, uh, a quick follow-up before I ask the question that I intended to. So your encryption proved to be a huge success and it became a global standard. How did you feel about that success? Because a whole lot of young cryptographers who come after you, look upon you as an idol. So how did you feel about the success of what you had created? Uh, we did our job is what it comes down to because at the time the internet was just starting people were just using search and that kind of thing it was very early and we really would not be able to 
enable any e-commerce or online banking or any of these activities that we take for granted today without, without the use of cryptography. So SSL actually, SSL or TLS did, did the job that it was supposed to do. It, it actually is doing what we built it to do. Uh, it became very successful, which of course makes, makes people who worked on that technology very happy. Um, but at the end of the day, we serve the society. It was a very, very important thing to actually get back. Thank you so much, Dr. Bhai. But uh, I also wanted to understand that today you made this great point. In fact, I actually didn't think about this, that, you know, while law enforcement agencies and intelligence and governments are constantly saying that, you know, the bad guys are using it, that they are doing this and so on and so forth. But that can't, as you rightly pointed out, come, can't come at the greater need of good, honest, ordinary folk and their right to privacy and their need for privacy. So how do you think can we balance this legitimate need sometimes when the state needs to actually, you know, not have encryption and to intercept communications? And as the case of India and many other countries, the fundamental right of citizens to privacy. So how do you balance the need for intelligence, et cetera, and that of citizens? So, so let me just correct one thing you said. I, I did not actually say that need for privacy is greater than the need for law enforcement to get data. We, we need a society that works well, and we need a society that supports this new digital medium because we're all digital. We're here on, on on video, I'm in the US and you're in India and we're, we're talking. If we ignore each other's needs, we end up in the situation we're in now. I claim that, that most, at least most of the industry players want to support their governments. But supporting their governments does not mean that all encryption is bad. It means that we need to do certain things to make sure that if people do criminal activities that we actually have enough evidence to catch them. That does not mean that we break all privacy for all people. Again, I'm not going to provide a technical solution, but, but the technical solution has to come from discussion between the two sides. Uh, you know, Dr. Tahir, in, in a country like India where privacy is not very well understood, I mean, we are 1.3 billion people, so there's not enough space for, you know, so privacy is thought of as an esoteric concept for many people for a long time until August 2017 when India's Supreme Court and a nine-judge constitutional bench ruled that privacy is a fundamental right for citizens and actually attached it to the fundamental right to speech, the right to life and the right to liberty. So uh, when, you, when you look at such a recognition coming from the highest court in a country as big as India, how much can end-to-end -end encryption contribute to making this right accessible to common folks. Like before end-to-end -end encryption, we really didn't understand how to get encryption for our messaging, for our chats, etc. But, you know, things like the signal protocol, etc., SSL has now made it very easy for us to have some degree of encryption and end-to-end -end encryption is doing a lot of that. So how do you think can this make it better for citizens? Let me just comment on, on privacy a little bit. Um, you know, all our societies, India or the US or Europe or anywhere, uh, if, if you go back a few hundred years, it was a number of smaller groups. Some places call them tribes, some places call them cities, but it was small groups. And, and to travel between one and the other was actually a big task. Within that tribe, there was no privacy whatsoever. Like everybody knew everything about everyone. You know, you, you see that in, in small villages in any country today. There is no such thing as privacy. Now, when, when, when the civilization, the current civilization grew and people migrated into cities and communications was enhanced, the value of data grew because now this data that used to be known within families and tribes now is known everywhere. And that actually does produce issues. So there is an issue to be solved. But it's not a fundamental thing as people, as people actually put it. We need to make sure that people, normal people who just go about their daily life are protected and are protected from, you know, people who conduct criminal activities. It, it's, it's, it's one thing that we actually need to, to, to work on. The encryption is one of the tools that we use to protect data. 
and we call it confidentiality, not privacy. Privacy is actually different. Privacy implies that you control your data, not just that it's hidden. Uh, confidentiality means that when you and I are having a conversation, only you and I should be able to hear the conversation or look at it or read it, depending on what, what mode of operation we're talking about. Privacy means that I can go tell a, 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 an office of some business, you cannot use my data. That has nothing to do with encryption. So privacy is a bigger scope thing, and it, it has a lot of legal implication that, that, you know, I don't think anybody here is a lawyer. So, so, you know, trying to solve privacy here is tough. But encryption is one of the tools that we use to, to, to actually aid in, in supplying people with the privacy that they need. Um, depending on how it, it's not just end to end. The word end to end is misused and overused sometimes. The goal is that data is only visible to people who are authorized to see it. And if we can implement systems that do that, I think we're achieving a really good thing. And, and it turns out you see that we need different technologies in addition to encryption to actually achieve that. It's not just encryption. Although, I, of course, I believe encryption is a very important tool. Thank you, Saikat. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Tair, I'd like to move to uh, uh, discussing payments uh, with you, especially, you know, when, when we are looking at the onslaught of COVID-19 and a lot of us are now working from homes, uh, ordering food online, uh, talking online, a lot of payments, a lot of transactions are also taking place online. And recently, India's uh, national security advisor commented that uh, because of this, there has been a rise in uh, the number of cyber crimes in India, obviously, because more and more people are now shopping online. Where do you see uh, encryption's role over here to secure uh, the payment gateways and the entire cyber uh, payment uh, ecosystem? And uh, as somebody who founded SSL, how, how important do you think encryption could be to protect ourselves from future cyber frauds? So encryption is already working. The reason there is a lot of cyber crime is that the user authentication is not working. We're depending on passwords. So when a, when a person logs into their bank or logs into a, you know, a site to do payment, they're using a password. The vast majority of, of breaches that you see in the world today have to do with user passwords, not with the lack of encryption. Um, so, so you know, we, we tried to solve that problem in, in the mid 90s. And of course it was too early, you know, people ended up using passwords anyway. So that is the problem that we need to solve today. The encryption part of TLS actually works very well. Nobody's ever broken that. Right. You know, we notice some weaknesses every once in a while and the, the, the you know, we update the specification and it's fine. But there's not, a, there's not a single case where somebody actually broke an SSL connection and took data, you know, out, you know broke the encryption part. So, so the overall system is what we need to consider rather than one component of it. Absolutely. Um, and moving on uh, to the global debate, which we are talking about, uh, you know, on encryption and uh, the need for data access by law enforcement authorities. And we know we are seeing this in India, we are seeing this in the US and other jurisdictions that, you know, privacy advocates and law enforcement authorities are at loggerheads uh, when it comes to this issue. Uh, you know, the, private, the law enforcement authorities and uh, recently I think there was a communique by uh, the Five Eyes where they are talking about encryption and uh, to uh, sort of uh, allow backdoors uh, uh, to sort of see some content online. So where do you see this debate shaping up, Dr. Thai? Like on one hand, you have the privacy advocates defending privacy uh, tooth and nail, and then you have the law enforcement saying that, look, uh, we might need access to the backdoor. What, what's your view on this? So, you know, I grew up in the Middle East. So you're asking me to solve the Middle East problem over, over the next 20 minutes, which of course we're not going to be successful doing. I, I, I think there is a presumption on both sides that the other side means harm. And I think an open communication is the best thing to do. Most of industry people that I've known and I've worked with over the last 30 or 40 years are good people, are normal people. They want their customers to have their confidential you know, communications and, and, and what, what have you. The word backdoor is incorrectly injected in the conversation. 
uh, you know, th there are ways that, that law enforcement can get their requirements done. And I, I do not believe that we have to break all encryption in the world to satisfy their requirements. But both sides have actually legitimate need for something. And, you know, one side wants data and the other side wants to hide the data. But we need to sort of, you know, work together on it, not, not hide it from each other. I have one question with regards to your previous response. You mentioned nobody has broken TLS or SSL. There are predictions that with the future of quantum computing, there's a possibility that somebody could break the SSL protocol. What are your views if this is possible? What's the timeline? Do we take 20 years from now? Uh, future of What is the future of quantum crypto? Your thoughts on this? So, so let me just make a, a, a small correction. If a quantum computer with the right power existed, it could break the public key cryptography methods that, SSL, that TLS uses. It does not actually break the protocol. TLS would not be broken. RSA could be or ECC could be. Uh, and that's what the Shore algorithm said when, when he did that several years ago. So, so there is a big effort, you know, that, you know, NIST is leading one of the efforts to standardize the substitute set of ciphers. So, you know, 20 years from now or some number of years, you will not see an RSA or an uh, electric curve uh, cryptography. You'll see a, a new style of cryptography that people have looked at long enough and convinced each other that it's actually safe against quantum computer attacks. How long will it take? is a debate because, you know, none of us is in the future prediction business. If any of us were in the future prediction business, we would be too wealthy to even have this conversation. Uh, so, so we're not going to be able to correctly predict the future. But there is a lot of money being spent on quantum computing. You know, some of them, some of it is, is for breaking encryption, but some of it is for other things because an a quantum computer that uses energy rather than than the, um, the, the the traditional semiconductor kind of computer, you know, does different things. So, so you will see that the uses for a quantum computer will actually be different from what we use computers today. You know, the fact that we have a seventy or maybe even a hundred qubit computer available today. Uh, does not mean that you, you draw a line and you say then after a few years, there, there's a lot of unknown. So some people say in five years we'll be in danger. Some people say 30 years will be in danger. Uh, you know, if, if, if you're a business or an organization, you want to plan for the future, it is something to think about and consider and cooperate on. The thing about the, thing about the internet is you have both the client and the server speak the same language. So one entity cannot fix the problem on its own. Uh, the truth is, at some point in the future, we believe that there will be a quantum computer that will break the current sizes of RSA and electric curve cryptography. And that the current data encryption methods like AES or, you know, or hash functions like SHA-2 will be weakened, so we need bigger keys. And we need to plan for a future that has different cryptography, different cryptography. That's, that's really what we need to do. The protocol has nothing to do with any of this. Because the protocol, when, when SSL was done, it was not dependent on a specific cryptographic method. It was done in a way that the cryptography is separate. So we can change the protocol on both sides and, and the protocol will continue to work, which was actually very advanced thinking at the time. There are other areas where we need to think harder because also there is a lot of regulations, financial services, for example, that require data to be encrypted at rest. So when you store data for, for any long period of time, you're required to encrypt it. That is actually interesting because the data lives for a very long time. So if the encryption methods that we use to encrypt that data become weak after 10 or 15 or 20 years, then we have an issue. And nobody is going to go around the whole world and re-encrypt petabytes of data just randomly. It's a ton of work to do. So each organization actually has issues to consider. It is not a trivial project. 
and it will take several years for any organization to think through. But yeah, we, we, we used the methods that were appropriate at the time that, that the original protocol was, was designed. And now, you know, you see people using elliptic curve uh, cryptography versus RSA, and they're both okay for now. Uh, and 20 years from now will be a different set, but they will still be okay. Yeah, uh, especially with the academia, they are constantly working on various hardware techniques like fault injection and side channel attacks to break the elective curve or the AES uh, RSA uh, encryption of algorithms. Of course. And the industry has to continue to do that. And academia, academia has to continue to do that. We want to produce systems that are safe at the end of the day. You know, we, we still change the, the safety in, in our automobiles until today. We, we put new things in the cars because they protect people. So we need to protect the data that, that, that you know, that these algorithms uh, protect, encrypt, or, or what have you. Um, and we will continue to find weaknesses. Uh, th there's no proof that any specific system is going to be safe forever. It never will be. It is not part of, of the deal that we have here. Uh, we always have to look at weaknesses and we always have to fix weaknesses. This is kind of the game that, that we have to continue playing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tahir. Saikat, over to you. Thank you, Antwich. I thought the last question that you put in came right out of a session from hardware.io. So <laughs> I suspect that's where you got this from. Uh, I'll be asking the last two questions, Dr. Tahir. I know you, you've given us your time. I know you also, you said that you know, end-to-end -end encryption as a concept is not the right way to describe this. But generically, if I were to use that, because that's what people understand it as end-to-end as -end encryption. But nobody knows what end-to-end -end means. <laughs> yeah, true. So when people say <laughs> that, I ask, my question is, which ends are you talking about? <laughs> which ends are you talking about? I, I completely agree. It just but, sounds like a fancy thing, but it's yeah, absolutely. not meaningful. But, uh, you know, the kind of countries we've been in and the kind of governments we've seen, governments can get extremely intrusive and, and they start looking at gathering information to control uh, people and manipulate certain kind of outcomes politically, etc. So when you have these technologies, do you think this would be a way to push back what we call a Orwellian kind of a, or a dystopian future? Uh, I think everybody has access to data. I don't think, I think governments actually have less data than the industry. And if you, if you want to talk about who has data, uh, the industry has more data and has more access to it. I think it's really important to realize that this is very, very new world we're living in. This entire phenomena is 25 years old. 25 years ago, there was none of this. Uh, we used uh, the internet to search for things and there was nothing actually confidential. So, so we're building a new world and there is never going to be a silver bullet to say this is how that the future would look like to protect people. I think we should stop thinking about silver bullets. I think we should, we should actually think about solving the problem as a big problem as it is and think about what our grandchildren are going to inherit. You, you, you cannot tell governments they have no right to access data because it's their job to protect citizens. You cannot tell businesses you cannot access data because that's how they sell you things. And there's misuse that is kind of hard to detect. So some people might actually misuse this uh, you know, availability of data and that should not be easy to do. But you know, and some of that needs to be done sort of cooperatively in a, for, from the technology standpoint. And some of that will be done with a regulation of some type. You know, we might need to develop better international rules because, you know, I am a U.S. citizen if I'm sitting here or I'm sitting in India, I'm still the same person. Who has the right to access what? Does that change? I mean, it, 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 it is, there's no answer to this. So, so we really do need to recognize that we're building a new world and that, that new world where, you know, our children, our grandchildren would live in. We want to prepare it as, as well as we could. We're not going to solve. There's no solution for the problem. I completely agree with everything that you've just said. But, you know, you also have governments today where 
if you see a, a year ago, we had certainly what is called the Pegasus incident where they managed to exploit a certain zero day within a video calling feature and start accessing. And as uh, this Canadian group work and researchers found out, a lot of governments were probably not acting within their own national laws, but were just merely exercising their power. So how much therefore can encryption really help and, and keep making it better and better? Because you know, privacy is so fundamental to the way we want to do things. Uh, so, so what you're citing, one example of a weakness in a system, and there will always be weaknesses in system. We are never going to produce systems that are completely protecting data. It's just never going to happen. Uh, the nature of the connectivity we have today would not allow us to do that. Blaming the governments is, is really incorrect. There is some person somewhere that did something, and if they followed somebody else's order, they followed somebody else's order, uh, there will always be zero day breaches and there will be a new you know, product that, that you know, goes in the market next year that everybody would love and somebody will discover a weakness in it. Somebody will take advantage of the weakness. Maybe somebody will take data and sell it to someone else. I mean, there is always going to be this. You know, the physical society is not free of, of problems either. We do have criminals in the street. But the problem with the internet is the reach is much, much bigger because you can reach the entire world sitting in your own living room. So, so, so there is a bigger issue. But the objective is not to prepare a connected world that is free of problems because that will never actually happen. The goal is to build a world that we know how to deal with, that the percentage of bad things is not arbitrarily high or much, much higher than what the physical world is. But the physical world does have problems. There are areas in, in different cities that you will never go visit because you just know. Now, the internet is harder to, to, to do that with because it's hard to tell which area is bad and which area is good. We need to solve that problem too, by the way. Um, so, so there's a lot of issues. We're building a new world which will allow the next generations to come to, to do everything uh, remotely or, or, you know, digitally. And that world is not perfect today and it will not be perfect ever. But it will, if it actually, if the dangers, if the risks resemble what the physical world provides, then we can live with it because we can, we've been living with the dangers of the physical world for thousands and thousands of years. Um, that's kind of my view on it. There will always be, there will always be weaknesses and there will always be somebody that wants to take advantage of the weakness. It's just the nature of people, unfortunately. Thank you, Dr. Kai. That was the final question. It was an absolute honor and a pleasure for all of us to hear you. Uh, over to you, Tazan, for the final words. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Tai. That was really great. And I think a lot of us, uh, you know, uh, watching from India, it's been a great pleasure for all of us to hear you and sort of understand from you on various elements around encryption, why it's important for privacy, why it's so critical for national security as well. And I think it's great to hear the point around, you know, why governments and industries have to collaborate. I think that's something critical for the Indian ecosystem as well. Uh, and I think you rightly pointed out that, uh, you know, Privacy has to be balanced with uh, security. That's an that's ever-evolving uh, discussion that we are having in India. And Dr. Tahir, we're really grateful to you for joining us that early in morning uh, from San Francisco. Uh, you know, uh, the tech policy ecosystem in India will greatly benefit from uh, the points which you have highlighted into this discussion. And we are really happy to have somebody like you talk to us in India and this is something which will add so much value for the work we are doing in India. So thank you so much uh, uh, for joining in today. And apologies for having you wake up so early. So uh, No, I always wake up early, actually. It's my nature. Uh, wake, up, uh, wake up early is not a problem. Thank you very much for having me here. Thank you so much, Dr. Tai. Thank you.